students, Neil, and we especially think that our friends on the right have gotten stale because they've, too many of them, become fixated on school choice as the solution to every damn thing that might be wrong in education. And uh, we think it's a good thing, school choice, in almost all of its uh, variations. However, it is not the solution to everything um, or, the, or the answer to all of the issues in education. Uh, as you're about to hear, incidentally, in these two terrific papers that we, that, that we have today. Um, I feel like I've known Kay Heimowitz and Nick Eberstadt approximately forever. Um, of course, yeah. when you get to my age, you've known a lot of people practically <laughs> forever. Uh, they're still young, of course, but uh, I'm uh, uh, weathering badly. Uh, and uh, we are here to uh, l first listen and then discuss with them uh, these th their papers for this project. Um, this is the second session. The first session, which was Mike Petrilli led with Heather McDonald um, just a couple weeks ago, is on the web uh, and well worth watching. Um, this session will also be on the web. It's being broadcast now, but it'll be available, um, we hope, forever. Uh, and uh, you will want to encourage, you will want to view it again yourselves if you're here, and you'll want to encourage your friends and relatives um, and everybody you know to view it as well, because it's going to be really quite interesting. I'll tell you in advance, the papers um, tackle education from quite different directions. And uh, we will do our very best in the discussion to follow, to... Uh, uh, find some common threads and some um, uh, interesting points of agreement or contradiction, maybe, uh, between them. But I think that you are in for a treat. I've asked uh, Kay and Nick each to uh, uh, talk for up to 25 minutes, um, and that will. Then I'm going to ask a few questions of each of them alone, and then we will all three get up here uh, and uh, have a conversation. Uh, but. Um, in the meantime, welcome to Hoover, welcome to Fordham, and uh, welcome, Kay Heimowitz. It is your turn. I want to thank Fordham for inviting me to join this, as uh, Checker calls it, stellar group, it, and it really is that. Uh, I'm honored. Uh, and I also want to thank them for uh, fattening up my Twitter feed for the last week or so. It's been very nice. Um, I'm going to um, talk about uh, what I call the cultural contradictions of American education. Ever since the early 2000s, educators have really been focused uh, on the disappointing school performance of low-income kids, and they were, of course, right to do so. As education became more critical to climbing the ladder into the middle class, poor children, as we know, are being left behind. Growing inequality, intractable racial disparities, and more abundant test scores and college graduation rates signaled that America was not fulfilling its central promise of opportunity for all. So I'm going to uh, risk seeming a little privileged uh, and ask us to turn the magnifying glass for a moment back to the middle class. Uh, they are, of course, statistically speaking, not the ones struggling to read and pass their algebra exams, and they're not the ones uh, flailing in our globalized, knowledge-based, and very volatile labor market. But I think if you understand certain facts, fundamental facts, about the middle class mindset, you have a better chance of diagnosing what ails our education system, not just as it affects the children of two doctors or think tankers, but also those of a single mother bus driver. Um, let's not forget that schools are designed and administered by college-educated middle-class professionals, and they inevitably bring their own cultural psychology, or perhaps you could say biases, to their task. And what I want to convince you of today, that there is something in that psychology uh, that makes running a classroom and designing a curriculum at all levels, and for all students rich and poor, something of a paradoxical undertaking. As I said, it's a cultural contradiction. Now, in order to uh, explain that contradiction, I um, want to go back to the baby in the nursery. Cultural psychologists, um, th these are people who study the way culture shapes cognition and emotion, have done some fascinating work 
comparing the behavior of American mothers and their sisters in young motherhood in other countries. And their research actually illuminates a little understood uh, realm of American exceptionalism. Consider one but revealing study of parental attitudes towards sleep. Uh, this one is by Sarah Harkness and Charles Super. Uh, and uh, they are, I think, a husband-wife duo who've done some just really fascinating research on, for, in cultural psychology. Now, they compared a group of Dutch and American mothers of newborns, and they discovered that the two nationalities, uh, despite actually some fairly close historical connections, had very different theories about what was going on inside those tiny brains. The American mothers uh, saw the tired or wakeful infant as expressing his own internal desires, his own internal drives. Babies know in some uh, subconscious way and signal when they are tired and how much sleep they need. Uh, Dutch mothers look at their uh, children much differently, at their babies much more differently. They believe parents must provide children uh, its what they call the three R's, and it's three R's in Dutch, which I don't know. But uh, two of the R's <laughs> can be uh, uh, translated into regularity and rest. Here's a quote from the study. Whereas the American parents describe their cheap, uh, child's sleep patterns as innate and developmentally driven, the Dutch parents hardly mentioned these ideas, and instead, instead spoke frequently about the importance of a regular sleep schedule, which they saw as fundamental to healthy growth and development. I don't know if we have any uh, parents of young children in the room, uh, but you might be interested to know that at six months of age, Dutch kids were getting an average of two hours more sleep per day than their American self-regulating counterparts. Uh, which uh, I think might be um, enough to, to, to make uh, converts of some of you. As the sleep study hints, from the time a child is born, American parents, or more specifically middle class American parents, act on a cultural belief that each child is an individual with a very distinct inner nature and unique needs, abilities, and predilections. That inner nature demands their preference, their deference, and their even their reverence. Most of foreign cultures, past and present, would find this a little, well, a little weird. For most of human history, the job of parents and the broader community has been to turn the uncivilized child into a capable citizen of an existing community with its own rules and history. Um, just to give you um, one example from France um, that I have from a, a British mother who was raising her children in Paris. She says that the French think of the child as, um, quote, a small human being ready to be formatted. I love that. <laughs> Partly by its parents. It has to be en cadre, kept within a clearly and often rigidly defined framework that places disciplines such as manners and mathematics above creativity and expression. Maybe some of you are thinking, oh, so there's, <laughs> that's what I've been noticing about American kids. American parents, by contrast, put their uh, emphasis on unleashing and supporting their little one's individuality. Customs, rules, and routines aren't unfortunately, though admittedly sometimes necessary, uh, per burden to the child's uh, own inner self. Now, I wager it's no coincidence that like their French, uh, the, like their Danish comrades, French babies sleep through the night much earlier than American babies do. In order to arouse their intrinsic self, this uh, inner self that's uh, just this waiting to emerge uh, with the right parenting, American parents talk to their infants more frequently and energetically than parents in other cultures. They cheer their babbling, smiles, and giggles. They celebrate the first time they roll over, crawl, and walk as a significant individual achievement. Uh, as time goes on, of course, they decorate their kitchens with their earliest finger paintings. 
uh, you should compare that to the Scandinavians who follow the law of, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this correctly, Yente, it's J-E-N-T-E, uh, and it's a commonly known uh, custom uh, among the Scandinavians that discourages attention seeking. Uh, one American mother living in Denmark describes an incident that captures the contrast I think, between American thinking and that of other Europeans, specifically Scandinavians, perfectly. Uh, she see, we were seeing a little, um, she had a little boy at the daycare center uh, take his first steps. She saw that, and she called out very excitedly, come on, you can do it, and uh, only to be reprimanded by a nearby teacher for giving the child the false impression that he was doing something special. In other cultures, both in the East and West, parents prize manners and ritualize courtesies over the child's self-expression. The French teach their two-year-olds to say bonjour madame or monsieur in every encounter. Pamela Druckerman informs us in Bringing Up Bebe, and if you want a uh, really interesting and, and easy to read in, uh, uh, book about these cultural, some of these cultural differences, I do recommend this. Um, it's it's uh, told as a memoir, it's not social science, but it's quite interesting. Cultural psychologists find that parents all over the world share this interest in manners. Japanese mothers, for instance, expect their children to be courteous, to say, say thank you and good morning, and, and also to be compliant, to come when called. Uh, by four years of age, um, I'll let you ponder that, <laughs> those of you who have children or grandchildren. Ritualized greetings strike Americans as artificial and a worrying sign of an overly programmed child. And I, I have to take a moment just to admit that this, this rang a bell for me. Um, and even though I was doing all this work on, on cross-cultural analysis, I still realized that when I heard a child, and there were some in my day, uh, when, when I was raising my children. Um, when I heard a child say, hello, Mrs. Heimowitz, I felt uncomfortable. It seemed false or fake or something. And so maybe some of you recognize that feeling. That is a very American feeling. Uh, and um, I actually now have a um, three-year-old grandson. Uh, and so it's been interesting to watch some of these things unfold with him. Um, and um, what I've noticed is that um, what American, some middle-class American parents are doing now is high-fiving young children, which is a really interesting way to get around the formality of the ritualized greeting uh, and, and, and yet still uh, be kind of, and do it in a way that's kind of egalitarian and playful. Um, here's a little quote from uh, that famous um, what to expect, the toddler years that so many parents in here, I'm sure, have read. Children who are nagged about their manners or punished for not using a fork won't feel positive about manners and are likely to ignore them completely when out from under the eye of the enforcing parents. Now, that is a uh, very American approach to the problem. Now, I don't mean to suggest that manners, or not to mention sleep, don't matter to American parents. And it doesn't imply that American-style individualism is an altogether noxious strain. But it does set the stage for what I um, am calling the cultural contradiction of American education. And there is a noticeable tension between the innateness of the child's interests, talents, and self-expression on the one hand, and the school as a collective enterprise on the other. As an American mommy blogger living in Norway was shocked to find out just how uh, alien that Western culture is. She writes, and this is Norway, which is hardly uh, you know, an uh, uh, authoritarian uh, nightmare. There is just one way, more or less, all kids go to bed at seven, all attend the same style of preschool, all wear boots, all eat the same lunch. That's the Norwegian way, she says. 
Uh, and I suspect that we could find a similar kind of statement uh, or, or observation from American mothers raising children in some of the other Scandinavian countries as well. Now, m American education institutions led by professionals, many of whom are parents themselves, inescapably reflect these same cultural norms. Take the dogma that classrooms, especially those for younger children, need very low uh, teacher-student ratios. They need uh, a small, very small classes. For Americans, small cl classes allow for individualized teacher-student interaction. And it's a crucial, perhaps the top ingredient for a so-called quality preschool. Uh, in fact, um, Americans prefer smaller classrooms at every stage of education, even in college. Now, uh, that this quasi-scientific truth is actually a cultural preference is one takeaway from the deservedly renowned Preschool in Three Cultures. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with it. It's quite an interesting book. Uh, it, it's an ethnographic study of early childhood programs in China, Japan, and the United States. And the research compared and videotaped these classes. And the interesting part was that they showed teachers from each of these countries the tapes of the other countries. Uh, and they asked American teachers to comment on what they noticed in the, in the Japanese and Chinese classrooms. As it happens, in Japan, it's not unusual to find a class of 34-year-olds, 30, you know, 34-year-olds, uh, 30 being the number of kids, with only one adult in the room. Unsurprisingly, after seeing the videotapes, tapes, American teachers objected that Asian children weren't getting the amount of individual attention they needed. Asian educators watching tapes of American preschools had the opposite reaction. They actually prefer larger groups. American children, they worried, were being confined in a, quote, narrow world. One Japanese teacher asked, I wonder how you teach a child to be part of a group in a class that small. The small classroom is crucial for educators trying to manage the cultural contradiction between each child's individuality and the presence of other, ch other children with their own in unique individuality. At Japanese preschools, children learn ritualistic traditional greetings, songs, and festivals. This, what, this piece I love. They don't celebrate the children's uh, individual birthdays. Um, but rather all the birthdays of a given month on a particular day in the month. Think of all the cupcakes you wouldn't have to bake <laughs> if, you, if you lived in Japan. The Japanese do give their young ones plenty of opportunity for free play, but while American teachers see that time as a chance for self-expression and free choice, the Japanese believe it is a chance to help develop, quote, group feeling. The former read books that teach respect for others and cooperation. Americans like, I think I can, I think I can, stories to encourage individual achievement and self-esteem. Uh, and American teachers not only give their charges, preschool teachers give their charges plenty of choices. They talk about those choices repeatedly throughout the day. What would you like to do? The classroom is a teeming warehouse of activities, uh, sure to elicit the interest of the most hesitant child. The preschool and three cultures researchers theorize that Americans seeing, see giving a child plenty of choices as the best way to appeal to his intrinsic motivation, which if you think about it is kind of a very American thought, uh, it, uh, a concept itself. Now, the relevance of this early childhood anthropology for K through 12 educators should be easy to discern. American uh, parents and preschool teachers are unknowingly preparing children to thrive in a particular sort of classroom. When a middle class youngster, youngster trembles at the kindergarten door on the first day of school, if she has been raised by American born parents, she has undoubtedly been empowered to make choices for herself, to have her talents and interests recognized and prized, and to speak up about her preferences. She is the perfect customer for a child-centered, constructivist classroom dedicated to intrinsic motivation, one who will work well with the guide on the side rather than the sage 
on the stage. Low-income children unversed in the ways of, what's your favorite color? And use your words and good job, a word that a phrase that my grandson I think heard, has heard 5,000 times, are entering a foreign country. The singularity of middle-class American child-wearing and preschool helps explain the stubborn hold of many progressive ideas on the educator's imagination. And it helps explain the frequent failure of those ideas on, with poor children. Whole language, for example, is predicated on the same ideas about the child's intrinsic self as those embraced by middle-class American mothers and fathers. Children learn to read by using their innate capacities the same way they do when they start talking. They don't need explicit instruction in phonics or spelling or grammar any more than they need lessons in how to ask for ice cream. Surround them with a variety of books so they can choose something to their liking and they'll discover sound patterns and whole words by uh, deciphering their context within a given story. The zeal for creative classrooms is also reflects a particularly American way of thinking about teaching and learning. Creativity enthusiasts see themselves as rebelling against mechanical industrial era drill and kill thinking that they believe dominates American schools. Uh, Do school, Schools Kill Creativity was, is the 2006 TED Talk by Ken Robinson, which was the most watched video in in, uh, t in uh, TED history. He answered that question with a clarion yes. Our education system, he said, is a death valley, a system based on standardization and conformity that suppresses individuality, imagination, and creativity. Uh, he wants, they want, he and people who are follow that kind of thinking, uh, want uh, classrooms full of uh, creative teachers who shun traditional subject matter and assignments like worksheets, tests, and essays in favor of dioramas, videos, acrostic poems, which I didn't know existed, but evidently is a favorite these days, uh, songs and various projects. A creative teacher, one of the highest compliments that can be paid to our guides on the side, is said to make for joy joyful classrooms and students. Uh, and as future-minded pundits repeat endlessly, creative thinking is essential for 21st century jobs. Now, I don't uh, want to deny that Americans have every reason to revere the creative brains in their midst. And our legendary ingenuity, innovation, and dynamism has been crucial for improving productivity and standards of living worldwide. Uh, we have, are the birthplace of innumerable world-changing inventions. The automobile, the suspension bridge, the light bulb, the iPhone, the hot dog. Uh, and the country remains the leader in the number of Nobel Prize winners and patents. But this creativity cry, craze pushes right into that dead end cultural contradiction I've been harping on. Creativity doesn't always play well with others. Self-expression can be at odds with civility, and order and safety demand that children curb their energies and keep their voices down. If the complaints of American educators are to be believed, today's school children are not such good students, at, uh, or C, maybe C students at best, when it comes to self-control, motivation, civility, or what is called frequently soft skills. Employer complaints about millennial soft skills gap, that's an expression you see a lot in the managerial literature, have become a recurrent topic at management conferences and uh, in their reports. Um, they complain about younger workers who have trouble getting to work on time, collaborating, communicating, and in general dealing with work, workplace discipline and authority. If you think about it, this is one predictable consequence of hyper-individualism of middle-class parenting and teaching. The guide on the side appeals to the child's unique inner nature, but fails to, na to challenge what I think is his natural egotism and immaturity. It also, uh, the, the cultural contradiction also helps explain America's uh, curriculum battles. The hyper-individualism 
conflicts with any notion of education as a structured transmission of knowledge from one generation to the next. The traditional disciplines that liberals used to and many conservatives still prize gets reduced from a shared body of knowledge to, at best, a rummage sale for enhancing individual meaning, identity, and creativity. Uh, they, educators also don't care for the subtext of traditional teaching. It communicates adults' recognition of children's inescapable ignorance. The teachers know something the child does not know. The teacher is an authority. The child is, well, a child. Personalized learning is the latest effort to, or latest reform to weaken the idea of education as a collective social activity. It portrayed as the welcome routing of 21st century know-how over the industrial age teaching. It's better understood as the supreme pedagogical expression of American individualism. Supporters, including powerful Silicon Valley charities like the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Susan and Michael Dell Foundation, want to use data and digital technology to more fully customize education to push teachers even further to the side by training children to rely on their, quote, own self-reflection and self-assessment. That's kind of scary. Um, personalized learning, obviously, bypasses any notion of shared curriculum, shared expectations, shared knowledge, and even the classroom itself. Each student is an island with their own personalized learning path. It's too early to determine what effect this latest foray into uh, hyper-individualism will have on flesh and blood children, rich or poor. But a recent paper from a Duke sociologist named Jesse Stribe uh, illustrates one danger. Stribe interviewed 132 middle class students. It's a small study, admittedly, but it's very suggestive. Middle class students up to four times during their transition to adulthood. And she discovered that 51% of the young adults in the group, and remember these, this is a middle class group, uh, were on a downward trajectory. They were downwardly mobile. Uh, they were, uh, and the reason that she found was that they were loath to adapt to more structured environments. Some saw themselves as too smart and talented to have to put up with required uh, coursework. Some dropped out of college or avoided grad school when they found they were unable to customize their schooling to fit their preference. Some quit jobs because they didn't like having bosses telling them what to do. And this is what she concluded, uh, Jesse Straub concluded. The very practices that middle class parents pass down to their children may move them toward class reproduction when they are young and in school and away from it when they become older and enter college and the workforce. Now, um, I don't think we should overstate what's happening here. Clearly, middle class kids are doing well enough, or maybe not well enough, but uh, well by some standards. So uh, uh, what their parents are doing is, is, seems to be working some. But she did find this remarkable number of kids who, at least in their 20s in their, and into their late 20s, looked like they were on a downward tra trajectory. I should also caution that given how long it takes for people to settle down these days in careers, uh, it could well be that, that she didn't get to the 30-year-olds and the 35-year-olds and that things would look rather different. I don't know. So one possibility is that we can teach soft skills, grit, self-control, attentiveness, uh, to compensate for the deficits in Stribe and so many employers describe. Deficits that I believe can be at least partially, partially attributed to hyper-individualism. A lot of uh, educators are enamored of the possibility, but I have my doubts. In most countries, soft skills are built into routines and shared understandings of proper behavior taught by parents and schools and reinforced by encounters with neighbors, shopkeepers, family, and friends. One of the French mothers quoted in Bringing Up Bebe explains that she insists her child say bonjour, madame, not because she sees her child as a martinet, but because she, uh, excuse me, she wants the right the, to remind her children that, quote, they're not the only ones with feelings and needs. With no soft skills curriculum in sight, the child is learning habits of empathy, humility, 
uh, and persistence, and possibly other things, emotional control, self-efficacy, and so forth. The American child, free to be you and me, has far fewer opportunities to practice these character virtues and turn them into habits. For lower income students, uh, the problem with hyper-individualist classrooms is not that it promotes entitlement, as Stribe describes. It's that family life hasn't prepared them for the individualistic middle class school. In all likelihood, their parents haven't organized activities around their interests and strengths. Perhaps those parents haven't even had the time to notice those, stre those strengths and interests. Uh, these adults have not uh, prodded the kid, their children to use their words or express their feelings or ask them a lot of questions about what they thought about a story or noticed during a walk to the grocery store. These, the kids, lower income kids lack, in other words, the cultural literacy to extend E.D. Hirsch's invaluable term to thrive in the contemporary classroom. I think this helps explain why charter schools with structured curriculums, rigorously defined rules and expectations have sometimes had better success with disadvantaged students. Those environments are less dependent on the uniquely American middle class vocabulary and ideals. Now, I want to end with a point that perhaps has occurred to some of you. Apart from its um, impact on learning, we need to consider what role an excessively individualistic pedagogy plays in the coming apart of American society. Growing up in a multiracial, multiethnic environment, American students already share fewer commonalities than students from other homogeneous, from, from more homogeneous nations. Instead of recognizing this dangers, educators have all but abandoned the mission of creating an e pluribus unum, of instilling a sense of common history and culture, outside that is of a few video games and a music celebrity or two. Middle class kids with strong families and social networks are able to counter the fragmentation, the disintegrating trust, and the loneliness of contemporary American education and life. If only the less advantaged peers were so lucky. Thanks. Uh, let, me, let me first say you've uh, made me want to banish a couple of grandchildren to northern, <laughs> to northern Europe for a few years uh, and see if they could maybe shape up a little. Well, I have uh, one that will go with them. OK, let's, uh, <laughs> let's organize an expedition. I think uh, uh, Mike Petrilli's got one or two candidates for a, 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 a tour of northern Europe as well. <laughs> Uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, and see if we can do a little bit with the in, entitled uh, self-expression uh, that I know some kids are growing up with. Um, I want to just touch on the uh, a sort of political implication of this, then we'll come back to a bunch of other things. I you got me wondering whether the right and the left aren't both in different ways worsening the problem that you describe. Uh, the right, by its obsessive view that uh, essentially choice, as long as you are meeting your own, <coughs> meeting your own needs and those of your child, uh, you've taken care of the education problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if that means there's less commonality, less common core, if I may use the expression, uh, less uh, unified civic anything, uh, and the left, with its, even though it d declares its fealty to the common school and to public education, uh, is nevertheless pushing for uh, rampant uh, diversity, rampant individualism, uh, e even d celebration of differentness, if I, if, if, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm wondering if we don't have both sides in the current political environment exacerbating uh, the trend that you are describing. Does that make any sense? Oh, completely. Um, and it, the, the thought that came to my mind was that, that federalism itself poses a bit of a problem here, <laughs> doesn't it? Uh, because, um, you know, we, we basically say to the states, you know, you're on your own here. You, you know, you, you should do it the way people do it in your state. Uh, and, um, you know, which further separates all of the states and certainly uh, you know, the blue states from the red states and so on and so forth. So I think, yes, it is a political problem, and I think it's shared on both, on both sides. And federalism then goes on to local control. Exactly. I am, I am, for my sins, still on the Maryland State Board of Education, and uh, trying to get Baltimore County and Montgomery County to use the same curriculum is impossible. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Trying to get them to evaluate their teachers in yeah. the same way yeah. is impossible. I mean, look, it's, <coughs> it is one way that the Americans have, for better and worse, and somewhat successfully dealt with their, with our diversity, uh, is to allow more localism, to allow, you know, to encourage more local expression of uh, local values. <coughs> so. It's, yes. a, it's a very tricky line to walk, I think. But we then push diversity into identity politics. Yes. Right. <coughs> and there's not much left in common. Right. We'll come back to this. OK. Um, <coughs> meanwhile, one of the nation's foremost demographers, uh, Nick Eberstadt, your turn. Uh, thanks to uh, Fordham. Uh, thanks to the Hoover Institution. And thank you, Checker. And thank you, Kay. It's a delight to be here with you, and ladies and gents. Um, I'm going, to be, uh, I'm going to be looking through the other end of the telescope at some of our educational questions. I'm going to be uh, 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 taking a look at our, uh, what I would say is a crisis in our labor market and asking the question of uh, education's role in this crisis. Um, the role perhaps in contributing to the crisis, and the role, uh, if any, of uh, remedying and um, redressing this crisis. I'm going to be talking mainly about uh, what I regard as a crisis of uh, work for men in America. I'm going to be focusing on that. Uh, by doing that, I am not in any way trying to slight the jobs problem that women in the US uh, today, I believe, uh, face uh, very much as well. The reason that I'm going to focus upon the guy part of the problem is because this development has been unfolding for much longer. It's been unfolding since the um, since the 1960s, and its uh, its depths, uh, I think, are much more more acute. Um, so, uh, I think we can start by looking at the male uh, work crisis, and then maybe later on examine the work crisis that's developed for women since more or less the turn of the century. But I'll look at the guys first. If you, you will, at this point, you're going to have to suspend disbelief and pretend that, uh, pretend that you completely believe what I'm saying uh, and that I, that, I have, uh, that I have data and facts which I could uh, adduce to, uh, uh, to make my case uh, for me. But uh, the, background, the background to all of this uh, is the virtual, um, I think we could call it, collapse of work for uh, American men uh, in the post-war era. And we know that there are a number of uh, quite remarkable and positive things in the US economy today. We know about the extraordinary increase in the generation of private wealth. We know about uh, some of the innovations that Kay talked about, uh, other discoveries and um, important uh, breakthroughs. But when it comes to looking actually at, um, at work rates, at, uh, at employment, we've got a situation which is not the almost too good to be true economy which we've been hearing about uh, lately. It's, it's really something more like a disaster. Um, <clears throat> if you take a look at the latest job report, the, one, the monthly jobs report, which came out with figures for September. Um, there's something that's called the employment to population ratio. It's basically a work rate. Um, the, the work rate for guys 25 to 54 years of age for civilian non-institutional males, uh, prime working age as it's called, uh, was a little bit lower last month, I mean, more or less as we're having lunch today. If we look at the 20 to 64 group as well, also lower last month than it was in, uh, in the 1940 census. So it's not, um, 
It's not hyperbolic to say that the work problem for guys in America today is roughly on a kind of a Great Depression scale um, uh, proportion. <clears throat> um, there's a big difference, though, between the work problem for modern American men today and the work problem in 1939. Back in 1939, there were uh, basically uh, just two employment statuses for guys. You either had a job or you were looking for one. You were either working or you were unemployed. The big transformation in the post-war era has been the emergence of a third employment status, which is uh, not in labor force, NILF, uh, neither working nor looking for work, being out of the workforce altogether. And that's been uh, the fastest growing segment of the American male working age population over the last, uh, over the last two generations. Um, if I had a chart to show you, uh, I would show you that today, for every uh, American guy 25 to 54 years of age, uh, who is formally unemployed, who is um, looking for work and doesn't have work. There are over three guys who are neither working nor looking for work. Okay. So you will appreciate that if we talk about the unemployment rate, we're looking at less than a quarter of the problem, right? Uh, <clears throat> this, is why, uh, this is why I think it's very important to look at what's called the declining labor force participation rate for guys, which is, and this rate has gone down uh, very steadily, almost relentlessly, uh, for the past 50 years. Um, under President Obama, the Council of Economic Advisors put out what I think was a very important report on declining uh, male labor force participation rates. And I think they get all sorts of plaudits and kudos for bringing the spotlight on that problem. Um, what they suggested, and I think this stands in line with um, received wisdom in much of the uh, labor economics community and in much of the policy wonkery community in the rest of uh, Washington, D.C., is that the problem that I'm mentioning to you is very largely, overwhelmingly, due to structural economic change in our economy, um, and more specifically, to a um, decline in demand for labor for people with less education and less skills. Um, if this assessment, which I think is the prevailing assessment in Washington and in the academy, uh, turns out to be accurate, then in one sense we've got a sort of a hopeful prospect because this is something that education can actually address. If what we've got is a problem of too many guys with too little education, we can try, for better or worse, to throw skills at it, to throw education at it. Um, there's something that we can do to try to remedy this aspect of the problem. Um, what I'm going to argue in the next few minutes is that uh, that assessment uh, doesn't look to me to be entirely correct. And I am not saying uh, that the demand side, what economists would look at as a demand problem, isn't there. It certainly is there. We certainly do have a problem with structural economic change and with uh, uh, less demand, perhaps, than in the past for uh, work with lower technical qualifications, lower educational attainment, and so forth. But I don't think that that is all of the problem. Uh, I'm not even sure that it is most of the problem. And uh, if we had a little bit of uh, technical magic, uh, you could rely on something more than my words to kind of back this up. Uh, but I'll, I'll go through my, my song and dance in any case. <clears throat> No, if, if, if what we have seen over the past 50 years with the um, virtual collapse of work for uh, many uh, groups in America, uh, 
is a demand and skill based uh, problem, we'd see certain things you know, which would kind of um, uh, would track with that. One thing which does happen to track with that is the work rates for prime age guys with, from different educational uh, levels. It is true that work rates have come down the least for men with college education. Uh, it's come down more than that for men with just a high school degree. It's come down the most for men who have no high school degree. So there is certainly a correlation uh, across the educational categories that would seem superficially to track with this received assessment. But there are many other important points that don't track with this assessment. And indeed, it should be very difficult to explain in terms of a demand-based shock, demand-based phenomenon. Do you think you're going to be able to get that up? No, OK. Um, <clears throat> all right, well, let's go through this quickly then. Um, and you'll, ha you'll have to take my word for it, which is uh, not the way that I like to teach. Um, if I were to show you a graphic uh, depicting the percentage of guys not in the labor force from 1965 to the present, you would see, and you'll have to take my word for this, um, you would see an almost straight line going from a low level of maybe 3 or 4 percent in 1965 to a level of about 12 percent today. It is not an absolutely straight line. Uh, there are little jiggles in it. For those of you who do like um, statistics, it's got an R squared of 0.97, uh, which is, I'd like to think, a social science straight line, since people are a little bit unruly. Um, what this line does not do is the following. <clears throat> it does not show a shock at the time of the Great Recession, which is what you would see if this were a demand side problem, you'd think. It does not show any corresponding shocks during the previous six recessions between the Great Recession and 65. You can't look at this line and see where China entered the World Trade Organization. You can't see where the US uh, agreed to NAFTA. You can't see where all of our beautiful little disruptive technologies came in. If the problem were a demand shock, a demand side problem primarily, the line that I'm describing couldn't exist. It wouldn't happen that way. OK, um, here's another thing you'll have to believe. Um, let's say that I had a chart and I were going to show you the US male labor force participation rate in relation to all of those of other never communist OECD countries. What you would see is, a, is that the United States uh, wins a race to the bottom that we shouldn't want to win. Um, US labor force participation rates for prime age guys fall faster and further than any other rich democracy in the world. Now, <clears throat> it's very hard to explain that from a demand side perspective, because the US economy wasn't the slowest growing economy among the rich economies over the last 50 years. Um, nor, for that matter, did the United States have the lowest level of educational attainment of any of these economies. The United States actually has one of the very highest levels of educational attainment of any of these economies. And you can say, well, maybe Americans are matriculated every step, but they haven't learned anything. Um, if you go, <laughs> I, I understand that's a, a serious objection. Uh, but OK, fine. So then you go and you take a look at something like the OECD's PISA tests, which do international standardization for pupils in grade school and high school, or at their PIAC tests, which look at adult learning, adult learning and skills, and try to standardize these things internationally. The United States is not at the bottom. I mean, the United States may be mediocre, but mediocre means like the middle. So this is another thing that can't be explained by a demand side uh, theory of what's, uh, of what's ailing American male workers. Um, one last thing, 
I mean, um, let's just use one more thing. Uh, if there are structural disadvantages for the least skilled in our society, um, one might think that workers without a high school diploma would all be more or less in the same boat when it comes to workforce participation rates. Um, however, nothing like that turns out to be true. And uh, you will have to believe me for now, uh, but if one were to show the workforce participation rates for guys without high school degrees in the United States, and to parse these on the one hand by whether these guys were born in another country or in the US, and on the other hand, parsing it by whether the guys are married or never married, you would have four completely distinct lines going in different directions. And the gap between the uh, participation rate for the married and never married um, native-born guys would be about 25 percentage points. Even among friends, that's a big gap. Uh, and if you wanted to look at the highest, which would be married foreign-born guys, and compare it to the lowest, which would be never married native-born guys, you'd have a di difference of about 40 percentage points. Now, uh, it's very hard to make the case that this has something to do with skills and education in the terms that educators usually use those words, right? I mean, I'm all for uh, thinking the best of international education systems, but somehow I don't think that Salvador's, El Salvador's K through 12 system is really 40 points better than the U.S. Uh, uh, corresponding K through 12 education system in terms of imparting marketable uh, labor force skills. <clears throat> there are things going on that I don't think can be explained uh, easily or perhaps even at all by uh, the received notion that we've got too little demand for less skilled labor especially labor for guys in the United States. So if that's not a satisfactory explanation, what else might be going on? Well, if you go through, you know, like regular, you know, like economics one, they'll talk about demand, they'll talk about supply, and sometimes they'll talk about institutional barriers. So let's take a look at uh, supply, at things that might be holding back, withholding the supply of work into the labor force. One of these things might be the way that our social welfare programs work and our social insurance programs work, and in particular, the way that our disability archipelago works. Uh, Uncle Sam does not do a very good job of <clears throat> gathering statistics on beneficiaries of disability insurance systems. And that's because we've got a lot of different systems and those different systems don't talk to each other. They don't play nice with each other. Uh, we've got, in, under the Social Security Administration, we've got SSI and SSDI. The Veterans uh, Administration has veterans benefit. There's work, uh, workman's comp. There are local and state disability insurance systems. They don't match up. It's impossible to get a single uh, number for the total um, uh, for the total number of men of uh, prime working age who are receiving one or more disability benefits in the United States today. It can't be done. Uh, who knew? However, there's a government uh, survey called SIP, Survey of Income and Program Participation, which gets a number of these uh, benefits, uh, you know, ask people to respond to whether they get these benefits or not. Um, they, they, uh, they ask questions about a number of these benefits, and when you look at this, which is as good as you can get right now, you see that about three out of five of the prime age men who are not in the labor force 
uh, report they're receiving one or more of these disability benefits, which is up about 20 points, almost 20 percentage points from a generation ago. At this point, <clears throat> at this point, more men uh, not in the workforce in this key group uh, report that they're receiving disability benefits than do not report this. It is, it is a main source of income for men who are not in the workforce. And that is not to say that, it, <clears throat> that disability insurance as it exists has caused this situation, but certainly it is financing a non-workforce life for, ah, thank you. Uh, if you take a look at the benefit patterns for men who are not in the workforce uh, by educational status, you see a really awful thing, uh, this is quite, a, quite a tragic thing, uh, that I'll try to explain from this chart. So you, this, is showing, this is showing beneficiaries by educational attainment. So if you look at uh, the first bunch of lines clumped together, that's, um, you'll see that guys without, some, without a high school degree, about 75% of them report receiving one or more disability benefits. And you'll see, if you go a little bit further over, that about 80% of those same, that same group of guys reports benefits from our low-income uh, government health care program, uh, Medicaid, similar numbers for Medicare. Now, why, is this, um, why is this so tragic? Well, you all know about the opioid crisis, right? You all know what's happened in America over the last 20 years with the opioid crisis. Now, more people are dying in America from opioid poisoning now than from homicide or from uh, vehicular injury. Um, until very, very recently, uh, well, let me back up one step. Um, if you qualify for disability insurance, for enrollment and eligibility and disability program, within a few months regularly, under ordinary circumstances, you also qualify for either Medicaid or for Medicare, depending upon how much work history you have in your biography. And until very, very recently, any state in the country, and the District of Columbia, um, you could go to a pain pill factory and if you found the right pain pill doctor, he would write you a script for 90 Oxycontins for 30 days, and that's a lot. Uh, and your out of pocket would be $3. And the rest would be paid for by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, th this is like uh, a screaming public interest magazine blazing example of an unintended consequence of government policy. I mean, this is just completely unintended, a horrible uh, inadvertent consequence. So uh, inadvertently, through disability insurance and our national health care system, we help to turbocharge the uh, opioid epidemic. Why am I mentioning this in particular here? Because uh, Alan Kruger, at Princeton, who was President Obama's uh, head of the Council of Economic Advisors, has since, uh, has subsequently in his work, showed that something like one half of the guys in this group who are out of the labor force report that they are taking pain pills every day. Okay. <clears throat> this is what um, would be called a supply problem. This is not a demand problem, this is a supply problem. Um, so let's go on to one last one, please. Okay. So there's also, there's also what we might call an institutional barrier, an institutional barrier to work problem. And this has been uh, critically neglected, I would say, in part because uh, my uh, brother economists have got this kind of a, uh, what we might call a uh, dog dish problem. Uh, they've got wonderful skills and techniques for analyzing well-behaved data sets. But if you don't have a well-behaved data set, they go and look for the dog dish, where there is a well-behaved data set, and then they analyze that, and they write papers off of that. We do not have, this is a scandal, but we as a nation do not have a government source of information 
to tell us how many Americans today uh, live with a felony in their background. We know about mass incarceration. We know about the two and a half million behind bars. We know that our level is, ratio is higher than practically any other country on earth. Um, what we do not know because we do not keep these data is that the people behind bars are only about 10% of the entire felonized population of the United States. And that uh, well over 20 million Americans today, uh, it looks like, are not behind bars, but do have a felony in their background. And the heroic piece of work that has demonstrated this is a study in Demography Magazine that came out by uh, you know, six of my uh, dedicated brother demographic nerds who uh, did the reconstruction of um, stocks and flows of uh, sentencing and release. Um, as of the 2010 census, uh, their estimate was that just under 20 million Americans, including behind bars, but just under 20 million uh, American adults had a felony in their background, obviously overwhelmingly men, right? <clears throat> if you extrapolate to today, it's probably about 24 million, somewhere around there. Subtract two and a half million behind bars from that, and you're well over 20 million in our society, albeit invisible. Do the uh, arithmetic a little bit further. At, that works out to about one in eight adult men with a felony in his background today, and probably rather higher than one in eight for this critical group of um, uh, prime working age men. Uh, clearly, this is an invisible problem and a barrier that we haven't really considered, but it can be, a, it may be a tremendous one. Um, can we go on? So, uh, Back in the uh, immediate aftermath of the Great Recession, it was maybe plausible to say that the uh, work problem was due to a lack of jobs. But you'll see that uh, that little red line there is job openings in the United States. This is total. This is not just for guys. It's for everybody. Uh, job openings that are unfilled in the United States on a monthly basis. And the blue line is the number of people who do not have a job and are looking for one. You'll see the lines past each other, right? So we have this strange situation in the U.S. today where we've got more or less depression level work rates for guys, and we also have a labor shortage simultaneously. This, you know, this is a problem. <laughs> this is a conceptual problem, um, unless you look at the real existing United States. And can we look at the last one, please? Um, so, let, so we look at the um, we look at the latest jobs report. Seven million unfilled, approximately seven million unfilled positions, and they're not all for NASA scientists and computer coders and uh, people who do you know, mathematical algorithms for Google. You know, uh, there's uh, over a quarter million unfilled construction jobs. Um, those require physical stamina, but they don't require college degrees. Uh, retail trade, over three quarters of a million job openings. Again, mainly not requiring higher education. Uh, leisure and hospitality, ho hotel, restaurant, again, sometimes specialized, very often not. You compare those unopened totals to, let's say, the number of prime age men without a high school degree, uh, it, it's a larger number than we see there. So um, what does all of this mean? Uh, in my interpretation, I'm afraid that uh, improving our skills and improving our education for young adults uh, while you know, absolutely the right thing to do, it's like mom and apple pie. Nobody's going to argue against that. It may not get the sorts of results that we hope for and want because we have other things going on in our society uh, which are creating uh, big impediments to fuller labor force participation for men. Um, 
what can the educational system do? Well, certainly, uh, certainly it can focus much more on vocational skills than it has, uh, both in K through 12, though I realize that gets me into an ideological minefield, and in uh, uh, post high school uh, vocational coursework. Um, we could, and I think we might very well be positively served by completely overhauling our uh, disability insurance archipelago and looking for something more like a work first principle, in which case there would be a great opportunity for marrying that with various sorts of training, training programs, experimentation. We've got this giant hole in our system regarding skills and training for ex-felons. And I don't think we've even begun to think seriously about what re-entry and training and education might, uh, might imply for uh, bringing especially men, obviously women too, but especially men back into the economy and back into society. <clears throat> so all of that. So we've got, we've got lots and lots of different things that we can do from different angles, not all having to do with traditional public K through 12 uh, education. But I think there'd be one caveat I would make. We live in a time when um, many institutions of civil society are failing or collapsing. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm... Uh, offering a sort of a news flash to say that the traditional family has been eroding and from what you could see there there's been a very close correspondence not necessarily causation but very close correspondence with the, the between the demise of the family and the downward slope of never married male labor force participation um, there's the retreat from public life of uh, with respect to religion there are many other aspects of civil society we could also see as being in retreat uh, because the because the school system is one of the institutions of society that has not retreated or collapsed or uh, you know or abandoned the uh, the battlefield everybody has got things that they wanted to do they wanted to serve as you know de facto parents. Uh, they wanted to serve as de facto confessors. Uh, they wanted uh, all sorts of other roles for them. Um, we have to realize how burdened uh, our, a relatively uh, a robust but fragile institution is in, uh, in the face of all of these different ambitious suggestions. Um, more than any of the other things that I've suggested here today, um, what might fix our uh, men without work problem would be uh, the next uh, great American awakening. I can suggest that, uh, but I certainly uh, can't propose any way of uh, managing that, and I'd be terrified if Washington uh, became seriously interested in trying to uh, micromanage that. Okay. So, uh, so this, this, is, this is another, um, I may have made the rubble bounce here a little bit, but I mean, kind of like going on and on about how demand problem doesn't explain where we are with uh, the, all of the kind of awful uh, aspects of uh, the work profile for uh, prime age guys in America today. But this is one. Um, so I admittedly was uh, trained in economics only slightly after the end of the Stone Age. But uh, back then, they used to teach us that if there was a shock to a market, the market would try to seek equilibrium afterwards, right? <clears throat> so if we believe the argument and take seriously the argument that there has been a there have been shocks to the American labor market, especially shocks to the uh, less skilled demand aspect of the American labor market, we would expect over time to see some sort of equilibration. <clears throat> Instead, what we see on a state-by-state -state basis is more and more and more disparity among states over time. It's as if the U-Hauls have never been invented, right? It's, <laughs> it's as if uh, people don't move to, to where jobs are existing. And in particular, the curious aspect here is that some of the states with the very most gloomy work profiles for guys 
are contiguous with some of the states with the very least gloomy. I won't say happy, but one of the least gloomy. So you look at the far uh, end of the scale, that's West Virginia, which is perennially um, troubled uh, in uh, employment profile. Uh, Virginia's got uh, land borders with, uh, with Maryland and Virginia. You can see them kind of on the other end of the scale. And if you look for Maine, you'll know that Maine only has one land border in the United States, and that's with New Hampshire. Maine's over there, New Hampshire's over there. This isn't what you would expect if you were looking at a demand-driven problem. Okay. That's, 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 I, I may have gone on too long about this, but I'm just trying to make the point that there are other things going on as well. Now, would you go to the last slide, because I have a question. Yep. The, um, the, the very last one. Yeah. Um, um, are we to understand that since these add to, I think, 5.3, yep. that the other 1.7 million have more than a high school diploma? Yes. They have some college or a college degree. So 1.7, roughly, yes, million yes. males not in the labor force in the prime ages yes. have at least some college. Yes, sir. OK. So it's not. OK, that's what I wanted to make sure that that was a, yes. uh, that number. OK, um, was there anything else on the slides? OK, so on uh, Nick first, yep. the uh, schools you correctly pointed out are given too many assignments and are asked to kind of compensate for everything else that's gone wrong everywhere else. Um, and uh, the, the effort to make them do soft skills that you talked about earlier is a, is a good example of that. If people aren't getting soft skills at home, or learning how to behave, uh, learning how to interact with the other people, we want the schools to add it to the curriculum. <clears throat> We've also talked, and my colleague Mike Petrilli has written about this, can schools do more with to inculcate what a lot of people call the success sequence in kids, which is to say a, a set of beliefs and aspirations um, and self-controls self that lead you to believe that you should get a job and you should uh, not have a baby without marriage, and you should behave. Um, in other words, these kind of um, character, temperamental, behavioral norms, if you will, that might possibly, and this is a question, though I'm stating in this statement, might possibly cause some of these males to not drop out of the workforce in the first place if they were, as it were, properly oriented toward how they ought to behave. Well. Uh, I'm not the one you should ask that. I should ask that question to you. Yes. I mean, because I don't know whether schools can do that or not. I mean, I'd love it if they could, uh, Checker. I mean, if if you think about uh, what would be what would be best in either a optimal, desirable in either a uh, religious or a uh, secular context, I think one would say that no matter what level of technical skills one ends up with, one would like to see uh, young men and young women uh, have their uh, tendencies for integrity and for reliability reinforced somehow through education. I mean, it's easy for me to say that because yeah. I don't know at all how a school system would do that. But um, just to, just to uh, put in counterpoint here, so we've got you know, we've got all of these guys who are out of the workforce and are playing World of Warcraft and uh, well stoned. You know, uh, we saw <laughs> it there. Okay. Now, um, there is some discussion in the uh, labor economics uh, guilds uh, literature about how once you get out of the workforce, you're kind of lost. You know, if you're out for 18 months, out for 24 months, it's like you're kind of a decay asymptote function or something. <clears throat> and and you're, like, you're gone or you're lost in space. But we know that's not quite true, because we've got this existence proof in post-war America that tens of millions of Americans were able to be out of the labor force for years and then re-enter. Mm -hmm. And those Americans were called women. And they were mainly called mothers. <laughs> now, what is it that a mother has that a World of Warcraft guy does not have that makes her a desirable entrant into the uh, labor force? Yeah. Reliability, keeping to a, not just a calendar, but keeping to uh, a clock. Um, a, no sense of obliga a sense of obligation. Oblig this, is, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Reliability and integrity, no matter what your skill level are, those are things that I think employers find very valuable. Can I add something yeah. here? Um, 
I spend a lot of time actually studying family breakdown. And, and I've written about it quite a lot. I've written yes. about it a lot. Um, and my, my conclusion is, and I, I won't attempt to convince you of it, I'll just assert it, is that um, a lot of what's happened has to do with the changing role of women. And um, you have a certain cohort of men who basic, whose, whose women, wives, their potential wives, girlfriends, yep. realize that they can manage on their own. Mm -hmm. And they might be better off on their own, to be honest. Uh, and I think that the, this is a, it creates a, a vicious cycle where men who might have been able to pull themselves together and get a job or uh, be, you know, stay off the drugs mm -hmm. or whatever because their kids were de counting on yep. them, yep. no longer feel that way. Mm -hmm. They're kind of an extra. Um, you know, almost irrelevant to, to family life in certain communities now. And I think it's been a catastrophe for, for young men, for, you know, for, for non-educated young men in particular. Disconnected from family, disconnected yeah. from work, disconnected from mm -hmm. other aspects of civil society as well. I'll tell you one little calculation that I think I put into my chapter. Um, if you look at Changes in, um, changes in family structure and changes in educational attainment. Uh, over the last 50 years, we've had a tremendous increase in at least matriculation. I don't know how much people have learned, but they've, gone, they've stayed in school a lot longer, right? Mm -hmm. And the people who have stayed in school a lot longer are also a lot more in the workforce. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we've had a, a collapse of the previous family arrangement, and there are now new arrangements uh, where the guys who are not in the workforce, no matter what their educational level, are way less like, I mean, no matter what their uh, educational level, they're way less likely to be in the workforce. The increase that we believe we've gotten from education mm -hmm has been almost entirely offset by the adverse trends in family. I mean, when you think of how powerful the increase in education has been over the last 50 years, mm -hmm. the disintegration of the family looks on the surface as if it's had an almost equally adverse effect to that. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal. Um, your prime workforce, your data were, basic, were based on prime age, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> And prime working age men, that starts 25, at 25, 25 right? to 54 is the one they, yeah, so, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does that, not me. So I do keep wondering what's happening to these guys before they get to oh. be 25. <laughs> uh, do they have jobs? Do they have part-time jobs? Do they have any work experience? Do they have any, uh, I mean, we know they're going to school up to a point. Yep. Uh, and, and we know that for better and worse, high school graduation yep. rates are up and college matriculation rates are robust and stuff like that. Uh, though certainly by no means everybody. Um, but uh, what is happening during those in-between years, those formative years, yeah. so I might even call, call yes. them, uh, and I don't think we necessarily know very much about what's happening to those who are not in an educational institution during those formative years. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, what, the, what, are, what are the dropouts doing? What are the kids who leave college then doing uh, instead of sticking with their community college that they entered after high school, things like that? It, it doesn't look good. I mean, it does not look uh, uh, encouraging. Oh, your felony population, your, your uh, people with a felony in their history, is the main point that they emerged from prison lacking uh, relevant skills, or is it they've got a felony on their record and no one will hire them, or is it both? It's, it is infuriating, Checker, but there is so little information I can't answer your question. Uh, what I can, uh, what I have done in... Uh, since the government isn't much help on this, there are some <laughs> private surveys, uh, okay. some, sometimes supported partly by government funding, which look at what they call criminal justice history, mm -hmm. you know, which is like the um, weird term for like whether you've been in trouble with the law. Uh, and if you look at that information, it seems to suggest that no matter what a guy's age or ethnicity or educational level, mm -hmm. no matter any of that stuff, if he's been to prison, he's way more likely to be out of the workforce than if he's only been arrested. 
-hmm. and he's way more likely to be out of the workforce if he's only been arrested than if he's never been in trouble with the law. Now, you know, we'd say mm -hmm. uh, that kind of, th that passes the laugh out loud test for me. Mm -hmm. I, I think that probably is correct. Mm -hmm. What we don't know then, as you were intimating, is whether this is because you lose skills when you're in prison mm -hmm. or whether uh, employers discriminate against people who've got a record or whether we've got a kind of like an adverse uh, selection problem in the sense that people who are more likely to get into trouble are also less likely mm -hmm. to be attractive job candidates or something else or mm -hmm. all of these things. But because we don't have the evidence, we can't do, you know, can't do policy analysis on this or come up with evidence-based policies. It's infuriating. We can't get inside that 20 million person population mm -hmm. to see what exactly it is that they're, they're, that is their problem. Well, I mean, this is, this is something, I mean, this is like, you know, we always talk about good, uh, good government. This is like bad government. Um, <laughs> I, I, have been, uh, I have been trying completely without success for about two years, not full time, but if you know, kind of like off and on, to get the one righteous uh, senator uh, down the block to write a letter to uh, Wilbur Ross and to say, you know, we'd like uh, to hold a hearing on work. And could you please uh, link up the records on parole and probation with the jobs report so that you can tell us what the work rates are for people in these. It would take, it would take one worker bee at census, maybe two weeks to do this. And they could assure the privacy of the records. Yeah. There's zero interest wow. uh, in this for reasons that just mystify me. I, mm. I can't, and, it, and it's blue and red, it's male and female senators. I don't see any pattern to it except that it's, it, it is what our uh, mentor, uh, Pat Moynihan, would have called uh, benign indifference, except it's not benign. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, are these men, do, do employers always check records? Um, if, you've no. had a, if you had a felony way in the past. Well, it, it, de it depends what sector you're in. Like if you're trying to get a job at Citibank, probably. Um, if right. you're going to, uh, if you're going to be a short order chef for mom probably and pop, not. probably not. Uh, you know, the people who do the big manpower survey sorts of things say that when they do manpower checks for employers, about one to two percent of the, you know, professional top white collar people turn out to have a little problem, and about 20 percent of people in the more or less the blue collar level. So not everybody does it. Mm -hmm. And in the states where people have tried to, you know, ban the box, we have another uh, classic public interest magazine, Unintended Consequence, then employers assume that everybody's a crook, yeah. and, uh, and they overcompensate. By race, they do. And, yeah. yeah. And then they, they hire yeah. less than they would have yeah. before. Yeah. By ban the box, you're referring to the not allowed to ask yeah. about a criminal record, yeah. right? exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and that certainly happened in some states, has yes. it not? Yeah. And, and, it, and it seems to have an adverse, banning the box seems to have an adverse impact on the hiring of low-skilled minority men yeah. because employers then assume yeah. that everybody's a criminal. Yeah. yeah. Yikes. Yeah. Or they seem to. I mean, that's what seems to happen. Okay. I want to come back to soft skills for a minute. Are we really saying, in <coughs> essence, that the effort to make schools attend to both social-emotional health and soft skills is, may be, in part, a consequence of our very preoccupation in schools with individualism and the fact that kids are not arriving uh, in seventh grade having already <laughs> got the what we now think of as the kinds of soft skills that employers would value because they are, haven't been getting them from their middle class parents or from their third grade teachers. Yeah. Uh, I guess I am saying that, <laughs> yes. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it is what I'm saying. Um, let me, let me just uh, think for a moment what, what, how I want to elaborate on that. Um, I, the point that I made in the paper, I would want to repeat now, which is that in most societies, children have an opportunity to practice certain kinds of behaviors mm -hmm. that are soft skills. It's, just, it's built into their environments. And that is much less the case in our middle class homes, uh, and much less the case, I think, in a lot of low income homes where parents simply aren't available. 
uh, and the communities are not particularly supportive of uh, those soft skill activities. So uh, I would say that, yes, we're not, we're not giving kids the opportunity to show, to, to learn the humility, the self-control, the, uh, emot the um, attentiveness that comes with just a certain level of civility of learning, of knowing how to control yourself in a, in a restaurant. <laughs> um, one of the wonderful uh, parts of this bringing up Bebe that I keep talking about is where she described, the author describes uh, her uh, little girl, American born, mm -hmm. uh, going to a crash, which is a preschool, I guess a, a pre preschool. Yeah. And at two years old, those children learn to sit through four course meals in the crash. With, with wine, no doubt, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and to evaluate, evaluate it as well. <laughs> How was the rope for it today? <laughs> <laughs> right. So imagine that. Yeah. You know, imagine that. Uh, if we try to take my grandson out for, for a meal, he, inevitably he's got a video of Paw Patrol in front of him at some back point. To, back to Norway. <laughs> back to Norway with him. <laughs> and, 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 and mine too. Yeah. Um, but the middle class parents who are encouraging their kids to make choices and express their individuality are also correct me if I've got this wrong, signing their kids up for scouts and soccer right. and right. piano lessons and all this stuff that actually fosters some of these kinds of norms and skills and behaviors and, and, That's and, right. and so on. That's right. And, I, and I, I gave you a kind of, I don't want to say a caricature, but an exaggerated vision of things. I think that there are an awful lot of American parents, middle class parents, educated parents who realize something's not quite working and they are trying to find ways to discipline their kids uh, in, in a way that's consistent with their own understanding of the child's needs. So um, there are just a, a, you know, hundreds of books about how to, you know, uh, one that I saw recently, One, Two, Three Magic, where you explain to the child, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take something away from you at the count of three. Um, that's, a, that's a classic, become a, a kind of well-known <laughs> approach to this. But I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that Yes, there's a lot of self-expression, but I think there's an awful lot of attention uh, and um, some restraint going on in, the, in more successful families. And some of it comes from actually the, the kid version of civil society, yeah. which is Cub Scouts and uh, yeah. swim team and Absolutely. stuff like that, where yeah. there's... A, their expectations, their norms, there's coaches, there's behavior, there's sportsmanship issues, things like that. Right, and, and let's <coughs> face it, if you go to daycare or uh, preschool, no matter how individualistic your teacher's thinking, mm -hmm. it ain't possible to really have kids that out of control, uh, that self-expressive, shall we say. You have to constrain yourself uh, under those but circumstances. But the poor kids, the disadvantaged kids, are probably not going to Cub Scouts and uh, on, the, on the swim team. <coughs> So those kinds of other forms of um, uh, normative behavior, if you will, norming behavior, if you will, are they not maybe getting? Right. Uh, I, I think this is a, in, a, in a similar vein and worth mentioning at this point. I've also studied a lot about sex education. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you find is that some of the more successful sex education programs don't teach anything about Seth, sex. They're teaching, you know, they give you a basketball team to go to yeah, in the yeah, afternoons. Yeah. So, uh, in yeah. other words, you, there are ways to approach this that, that wouldn't be direct yeah. teaching of soft skills, uh, but would be picked up in the environment on the activity okay, can itself. I, can I ask you and also check her a question about this? Um, I would, my impression is that the U.S. American conceit is that our kids and our educational system encourages initiative and kind of take chargeism yeah. or whatever we'd call that. Yeah. And you learn how to learn and uh, do all sorts of things that you don't do through rote memorization. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then 
some would say, okay, if you look around the world now, you see uh, in Europe and in Asia people not only copying aspects of the, at, at the highest education level, not the K through 12, right. but in the business schools and things, not only copying this kind of American system, but bringing the Americans over to make them do it the right way. Right. So where, so, so where does the American self-conceit about what we do well fit into the whole panoply of what kids really need to have? Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, is, is it important, of limited importance, importance in certain areas, uh, just ignoring all sorts of things we should be doing instead? Mm. I mean, these things are always a matter of balance. You know, I, yeah, exactly. I, I did, uh, you know, I think there is something to the American way that we don't want to give up. Uh, and that we are teaching a certain kind of, um, or, or encouraging or promoting a certain kind of initiative, uh, innovative thinking. Um, uh, you know, you can look at the at the numbers of our uh, of our uh, patents just to get sure. a sense of that. But um, it has to be balanced more, I think, with a sense of, that you are part of a of a long-lasting community of, uh, with expectations, with certain rules about, about life that um, will constrain you to a certain extent. So again, it's a matter of balance. I would never want to argue that we want, that we, I'm not going to argue that we need classrooms of 30 kids for preschoolers. I don't think that would work for us. But I think there is a, a more of a way to, uh, figure out ways to counter. I want to come back to the class size in a, in a second because that's got its own issues associated with it. But on the balance point, yeah. um, economists have argued, debated for years whether education is a public good or a private good. You know, it's a public good because the society will be economically competitive. It's a private good because it will enable you to support yourself and your family. Um, and they always end up, all the sane ones anyway, saying it's both. Sure. Uh, it is both at the same time a public good and a private good, and uh, that is a balance that needs to be struck. We need to help people prepare themselves to succeed in life. At the same time, we need to prepare a generation to enable the country mm -hmm. to succeed or the mm -hmm. society to succeed. Public good and private good. It strikes me that that's a kind of that economist argument is 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 analogous in many mm -hmm. ways to what you're saying on the cultural side, which is the, the, the need for some of both and the need right. for a balance between them, mm -hmm. and that we may have gone haywire in terms of the, the, the balancing. Um, uh, once upon a time, when I was at the US Department of Education, and back when Jap Japan's economy was seemed to be the strongest yeah. in the world, <laughs> we did a bilateral study of each other's <clears throat> education system. The US uh, studied Japanese education. The Japanese studied American education. This is late 1980s. And guess what? We each ended up envying the other. <laughs> uh, we envied the Japanese because they had a very high level of basic skills in just about everybody. They envied us because we were creative. And um, they wanted to learn more, as the Chinese are trying to figure out today, how can our education system produce people who are more creative? We wanted to know, how can we produce um, a much larger number of people who in have basic skills? I, I had visions. Uh, at the time of, of ships crossing in the Pacific <laughs> um, as uh, Japan sailed um, eastward and, uh, we, and, and, we, and we sailed westward. Uh, but I think this is an, an, another balancing question. It's very difficult to teach creativity, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, it's a, as much a cultural thing and an expression of, of, of individualism and, 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 and entre enterprise and freedom and stuff like that. Uh, it's frankly a lot easier to teach basic skills, yeah. um, but that only works in an environment in which there is an acceptance of the fact that there are common basic skills that everybody needs to learn. Right. Yeah. And conservatives haven't been good at this lately. Uh, you know, coming out uh, crusading against the Common Core um, skills, for example, uh, crusading against all sorts of other kinds of efforts to bring some uniformity into the, in, 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 into the educational process. I don't think liberals are very good at it either anymore. Um, but as I said earlier, I, th I, th I think allowing <coughs> individual, individualism, in their version of individualism, mm -hmm. identity politics and, 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 and diversity, to substitute for a kind of common good a view of education. But on the narrower point about class size, the 
American obsession, and it's promoted not just by, by parents who want their kids in a small class, it's also, of course, uh, by teachers who want to teach a small class, and the unions that want lots more teachers, uh, which we will, and ed schools that do too. <coughs> this ends up being why we don't pay teachers very well. Yeah. Because we have so damn many of them. Mm -hmm. um, we have four million teachers in, 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 in the American K-12 system. Um, and uh, it is the largest single workforce in America. Um, and uh, at that number, A, you cannot assume that only the best and the brightest will fill it because there aren't enough best and brightest to go around. And B, you can't pay very good salaries because uh, there are so many people need to be paid. And how does that compare to other countries? It's radically different. It's not just the 30 kids in the, in, in the, in the preschool that you... Uh, uh, the, so we've done it to ourselves. I mean, when, when I was a kid in school in Ohio in the 1950s, the, the simple ratio of kids to teachers in America, public school, was 1 to 27, 27 to 1. You look at the exact same da data today, and it's 14 to 1. Wow. Does not mean that classes are all 14. It just means that a whole right. lot of people are employed as teachers. Some of them are specialists. Some of them are doing special ed. Some of them are, I don't know what they're doing. They're in the rubber room. Um, the, uh, uh, but um, it's 14 to 1 using the same long division yeah. Well, yeah. That, yeah. that in the 50s yielded 27 to 1. Wow. And so no wonder salaries don't keep up. I mean, salaries have just barely stayed flat because we keep hiring more and more people. Uh, and that's because everybody wants smaller classes. And, uh, this is not a good thing for professionalizing the teaching workforce and all those other developments that we would like to see and what, happen. What is the ratio in some of these other countries? That... Be much more like one to twenty-five. Um, and another equally relevant point, and and we have some Fordham data on this. Uh, the U.S. has by far the largest number of non-teacher employees in the school system of any country on the planet. Roughly 50% of the employees of American public education are teachers, and roughly 50% are not teachers. Wow. Uh, nobody else has numbers anything like that. And the non-teachers are everything you can imagine. They're everything from custodians to bus drivers to cafeteria workers to social workers to uh, um, uh, security people. Uh, but there is a very large part of the education dollar goes to paying non-teachers. Administrators, too? Is well, sure. Yeah. But that's actually the, just the tip of a, of a bigger iceberg. In any given school, there are usually more people working in the cafeteria than there are in the principal's office. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and so on. OK, I'm just about to talk to us out of time. Are there folks in the room who probably uh, have questions they would like to ask our two distinguished speakers? And this is your chance. Um, I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. I was lucky enough to have John Dewey as my godfather. Wow. So I come to look at education through a Dewey lens. Mm. I guess I've always started from the perspective that we didn't pay teachers well enough, and therefore they didn't have a lot of respect. I mean, that's the way they feel. I think the whole question of developing respect not only for the teachers, but for the kids in school, turns out to be a very important element of growing up. And Francis Fukuyama has a really interesting book out right now called Identity. Mm -hmm. And so you get this whole question of what is our identity like and how do we make that happen? I think we have to, I think we have to in fact, pay teachers more. Now, I know that that is at a local taxpayer dollars. And that means that if you grow up in Scarsdale, New York, you have a lot of money. If you grow up in Yonkers, New York, you don't have a lot of money. And maybe these are some of the things that need to at least be discussed to see if we can make it. And how would you go about doing that? Well, they do keep getting discussed. School finance equalization has been an issue in every state in the country. Uh, and it's currently an issue in Maryland where I have the uh, ill fortune to be on a statewide commission on school finance yeah. <laughs> and uh, how to tweak the formulas that uh, lead to uh, one county getting more money than another county and equalizing across and stuff like that is very much on the policy agenda. It's also the subject of many lawsuits in almost every state Supreme Court in the country. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but it doesn't produce 
highly paid workforce. Yes, they're better paid in Scarsdale than in Yonkers. There's no doubt about that. Um, but you're, you're typically talking about a difference between $70,000 and $60,000, or $80,000 and $68,000. You're not talking about $180,000 uh, versus $80,000. It is not that kind of a difference anywhere in the country. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I want to return to my previous point. We have tended to take all the additional money that we put into public education and use it to hire more people rather than to pay people better. We've used it to hire more people. And I don't know if that, I don't think that can be reversed going forward. Maybe something can be done about it. Um, I, but that's one of the reasons why we don't have the pay. I don't think pay all by itself is sufficient for respect, myself. Um, but it's, uh, of course, it's an element. I, I'm struck by how much PhD faculty members earn because they have a PhD. And I'm struck by so many of them that I know stopped learning in a world where things are changing so fast. But, and they get all their papers reviewed by the folks they went to graduate school with. All right. You're on to a, a <laughs> different topic, which we don't have time for. I don't disagree with you at all. In the back. Hello. Um, I'm Laura LaGerfa. I'm on the National Assessment Governing Board. Um, but I have a question. I'm trying to um, reconcile what I hear as an inherent contradiction. This is to. Um, um, so if the norms and the collective are mediocre or problematic, and I look at that in terms of like everyone when I go to a restaurant is having their kids watch Paw Patrol, yep. and I don't like that norm. My kids don't do that. So now I look to um, how do you let ones excel? Because there are kids who are actually not in front of a screen all the time, whose parents work really hard to ensure that their kids are excelling and can excel, but the norms may be actually the problem. And so then I look to personalized learning as a remedy for that, but then I understand <laughs> the inherent issue with having personalized learning where there's no, none of the commonality and the common good. Mm -hmm. So when, a, when if the common good is not good, what, what yeah. then? That's, uh, you put it very well. Uh, and I, I don't know that I have an answer for you. Uh, and I certainly experienced that when I was raising my kids, too. Um, you know, it's one of, the, one of the problems with living in a very diverse country is you're surrounded by people who are raising their children very differently than you are. And I'm not talking necessarily different races, even different classes. I found it even in a very middle class community that uh, the idea of what movies they were, should be watching and what, uh, you know, uh, how much homework they should do and all of that completely up for grabs. And um, it's just a fact of American life and I, will, I don't if, really have an answer. If Laura weren't so valuable in her present role, I would suggest that she and her family move to Norway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I, but I did want to disagree with you slightly about personalized learning myself because you gave one version of it, which is the everyone learn their own thing version. There's another version of personalized learning, which is move at different speeds toward a yeah. common goal. Yeah. Allow, yeah. allow individualized pace, right. but toward something in common at the end. Right. So I think that's possible. I, I, it, personalized learning, I gather, from doing a little research on it, is that uh, is one of those terms that can be used by a lot of people who just want to sound up to date. Yes. You know, and, and yes. so it's, it's not clear what the meaning is all the time. So. That makes sense, what you're saying. Well, every time we try to wrap our minds around it at the Fordham Institute, we discover that it has many meanings. <laughs> um, and, uh, and therefore, of course, it pleases everyone and frustrates uh, analysts uh, mm -hmm. like, 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 like David sitting here, uh, who would love to be able to do a study of personalized learning, except it turns out they have <laughs> nothing in common. <laughs> well, they're personalized. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's personalized. OK, others. Uh, we're almost out of time. Others with a question or thought? Yes, please. Sorry. Hi, my name is Holly. I'm an intern at the College Board. Um, I was just wondering if any of you have read the book by Annette LaRoe. It's actually an ethnography, Unequal Childhoods. <coughs> yeah. Have you read that? Yeah, yes. I was thinking about that while you guys were talking about how um, students, um, children from lower income socioeconomic levels are not participating in extracurriculars, but um, that ethnography mostly focuses on how the parenting styles affect student success. So it wasn't really a question, but definitely a book suggestion because it tackles that and how students, 10 years later, she does a follow-up and how that affects student success. And 
I don't know, what's your take, uh, if you've read it, how it relates to your study? Well, number one, it's a really important book because yeah. it um, gives, it gives a, cl a close look at the difference in class um, and not, not by race, by the way. There's a middle class black family that she includes in there whose behavior with their children is very, very similar to the white middle class families she goes over. So um, there's, there is a, uh, a big divide, uh, separate and unequal families, really. Uh, a very important work. I think there are certain aspects of the work that I would question now. And I mentioned the paper by Jesse Strive. Um, she's doing some very interesting uh, work on culture and parenting. Um, and one of the things she noted about Moreau's uh, vision was that she does tend to emphasize the entitlement that comes from the middle class parents who engage in what, in what Leroux calls concerted cultivation. And that is where the child becomes this kind of center of activity. Uh, and um, always try, the parents are always trying to find the right uh, thing to appeal to their interest to their, uh, to their needs, to their talents. And as opposed to um, middle, uh, working class parents who are more likely to think in terms of uh, natural, natural growth, I think is the term that she used. And they just sort of assume these things will take care of themselves. Um, I the, think the title once again is? Unequal Childhoods. We are about out. Um, I really want to uh, first ask you to join me in thanking Kay and Nick. <laughs> Thank you.